The other Terry. Not this Terry. The other Terry. Before you. No, no you're after Terry. Okay, can I have everyone's attention? We're going to get started. Um, so thank you all for coming. It's an amazing turnout. I think we are at capacity. Um, and we do have a fire code consultant here in the room. Um, my name is Maria Denegri. I'm the chair of the Toronto Society of Architects. And this is our um, second urban affair forum of the year. Um, there's a couple of um, thank yous before we get started. Um, and I will also just walk you through how the evening will go, um, and then just a little bit of housekeeping that we need to do. So first and um, foremost, I do, would like to um, thank LRI um, for their sponsorship. Um, their kind donation makes these events possible, it allows us to rent space, um, flying speakers, and offer all of this to you for free. Um, next, yes, yeah, so thank you, Nate, who's here. Um, next, I'd also like to like, um, thank Daniels, um, the school, for kindly allowing us to host um, the event in this room. Um, given the success of this event, hopefully next time we come, we'll be able to use the big room, and they'll be, we'll be able to have 400 of you here instead of 100. Um, so cross your fingers for that quick completion. Hey? <laughs> um, so the um, event tonight is eligible for structured continuing ed hours, um, which I am sure is one of the reasons why so many of you are here. Um, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, so you do need to register though, so make sure that Joelle or Jocelyn, who were at the door, have um, scanned your name. Um, and the name needs to match the certificate or the, the, the ticket that was issued. So if there is any difference in that, please um, let them know. Um, as well, I think you all know that you do need to be here to get the hours, right? <laughs> so we are, after all, part of the OA, so we um, need to be kind of um, above boards on this. Um, it, we will be um, offering another two um, continuing ed structured hour sessions in the architect, as part of the architect at work um, trade show that is um, scheduled to occur next week. We encourage you to come out. Um, it's on the 11th and the 12th. So um, and the uh, the um, the trades are also as well. The boots are pretty incredible. That's very interesting materials and a lot of experts on the floor. Um, so it's a little bit of a different kind of trade show than the ones you may be used to. Um, and they do also offer um, wine and food as you mingle through the booths. Um, so the, um, what I'm here to do is I will introduce um, Terry Peters, who is the brain power behind the event tonight. And um, she will then introduce each of the speakers. At the end, we will host a Q&A session um, and give you the opportunity to um, you know, ask questions and share in the, the floor. OK. So Terry Peters is an architect and a sustainable design researcher with a PhD in architecture from Aarhus Architecture School in Denmark. I'm not sure I pronounced that right. <laughs> you can correct the, <laughs> the pronunciation. She held a, a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto from tw tw 2015 to 2017, where she focused on design for health and well-being and the potentials of environmental simulation to improve daylight and experience in residential buildings. She's currently an assistant professor at Carleton University in Ottawa. Terry is, has authored 20 peer-reviewed journals, articles, and conference papers on sustainable design, as well as several books and, and journal issues. She's the editor of a special issue, issue on, of architecture and design, Journal Design for Health, Sustainable Approaches to Therapeutic Architecture. This evening's speakers are drawn from the special issue of AD. Terry's term, super architecture, comes from her reframing of sustainable design as needing to be driven by human experience and values, and better connected to the net positive outcomes for both people and our environment. 
Her interdisciplinary research investigates the architectural and human dimensions of sustainable architecture. So join me, join me in welcoming Terry Peters. Okay, thank you, Maria, uh, for that introduction. And um, thank you all for coming tonight. And, and as Maria said, to the, uh, the School of Architecture here for hosting us and to the Toronto Society of Architects for putting this all together. It's great to see so many people uh, here to talk about design for health. Uh, so I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to just briefly kind of frame the issues that we're going to talk about uh, tonight in, with the various speakers. And I'm going to introduce um, a recent publication that I edited that um, Maria um, explained there. It's, um, it's an issue of AD Journal. And, um, it, and it, within this journal, it's design for health is such a huge topic. I, I kind of chose one slice to focus on, and that's how architecture can actually benefit people and our environment rather than one or the other. So the positive co-benefits of um, health promoting sustainable architecture. <clears throat> so the concept of super architecture comes from in the idea of enlarging the scope of sustainable design to include people, not just, not just our environment. Um, and often we view sustainable design as if we're somehow not a part of the environment, which of course we are. So this idea of reframing sustainable design to be about our experience and our health and well-being um, is an important one. Um, so I have some examples to share with you uh, in this short presentation that will hopefully sort of kickstart our discussion tonight on design for health. So um, many of you maybe know the, the AD Journal series. It's a themed journal um, and uh, it's a UK publication founded in 1930 with a long history of these themed issues uh, around issues in practice and theory connected to architecture and design. So interestingly, this was the first issue in their long history about health. Uh, so I thought that was kind of important that we're, we're seeing health as maybe being something so niche instead of being so central to, to architecture and design. Um, and in the special issue, um, I, uh, there were 16 different authors that, that contributed texts, theorists and architects and designers and landscape architects, um, and from a range of, of international offices, including uh, the people speaking tonight. Uh, and to give you a few of the, a few highlights of, of what's in the issue, um, the cover image um, of the journal is taken from a project by C.F. Muller Architects in Denmark. Um, it's the essay written by the partner Julian Weyer um, talks about the firm's approach to designing with landscape and views for healing environments. The essay by Charles Jenks, um, an architectural historian and landscape architect, Charles Jenks, uh, his essay was about the role of architecture and architectural quality in creating therapeutic environments. He, talked, he wrote about the Maggie Centers. And an, another scale uh, was the work by Eric, who looked at larger scale urban issues of how to design environments that are active and health promoting. And during my year long um, time editing this, this special issue of the journal, and then in parallel doing peer reviewed, um, more academic research on the links between health promoting architecture and um, environmental architecture, uh, some themes emerged and perhaps some of these uh, we will talk about in the Q&A afterwards and they'll come up in, in tonight's discussion. Um, this uh, focus on interdisciplinary approaches, uh, health is something that, you know, there's a lot of territory in design for health and well-being, so it really, really needs to have an interdisciplinary approach. Um, when you think about the people in healthcare architecture, you think, well, who, who's responsible for, for people in architecture? Uh, the human dimensions of green building, really checking our priorities and making sure that we're evaluating what we want to evaluate. 
uh, better data in our understanding of um, evaluating green buildings and health promoting buildings, and um, strategies of monitoring performance. Uh, so, as I've said, I'll, I'll give, I'll try to frame the issues um, of how I'm looking at design for health here, uh, and um, I, I looked at a series of international examples about design for health and well-being, but what always strikes me is that this isn't something new in architecture. We've always designed for health and well-being. It's, it's a fundamental part of architectural design, and there are many examples of designing spaces intentionally to make us feel better. Um, I often start talks about, about daylight and health by looking at the cure cottages, this new typology of health slash healing environment um, between around 1873 until antibiotics were invented to deal with tuberculosis. These cure cottages, um, this one's in Saranac Lake, New York, were where people came for a therapeutic environment. They came here to, to take the cure, to have fresh air, light, nutritious food. And they, these cure cottages have their own distinctive architectural features. They have big windows, porches, wall-to-wall -wall sliding windows. And sanatoriums with cure porches like this one were a new architectural typology, and it offered new ways for people to connect to nature and connect to health and well-being. Um, but today, the context of health and how we think about health is changing. And it's not, um, it's, it's not diseases, uh, contagious diseases that are causing um, people to be unwell. It's heart attacks and strokes and cancer and diabetes. Uh, so what do we expect from health environments? And many of the people writing essays in this issue really took different wide-ranging approaches. And I think it's interesting to explore the other aspects of health, psychosocial health, emotionally supportive spaces, and this idea of building as therapy. So in rethinking sustainable architecture and design for climate change and well-being, um, we need to connect to nature and our, and our environment sort of in the same way as with the cure cottages. There are ways that we can reconnect to our environment and you know, design environmental and health promoting architecture. Uh, this project is by um, Michael Green Architects um, in Vancouver. And I chose this as an example to show you, um, to illustrate this idea of super architecture in terms of emotionally supportive spaces. Because this is a, a building built on a hospital campus, but it's not a healthcare environment. It's designed to support people who are, have a, a relative or a loved one that are going through treatment um, uh, at the hospital. So it's a space that promotes, pr provides emotional support for people but doesn't actually treat sort of health in the same way. Um, and the architects designed the building to be home-like, to be playful, uh, to be non-institutional, uh, and to balance the needs of, of privacy and community. And it's 73 apartments for families to stay in while they're receiving care. And um, the architects are known for their innovative approaches to wood. And this building features um, a special tilt-up laminated timber structure that's lightweight, environmentally friendly, and it was a key strategy for the LEED Gold rating. So while it's not a patient care facility per se, it's designed to provide a healthy environment for people with weakened immune systems, um, using daylight wherever possible, natural materials, natural ventilation. And it's a, it's a beautiful uh, space inside. Another um, aspect of what I'm, what I'm calling super architecture, these spaces that are, these environments that are designed to both uh, promote well-being and environmental design um, multi-sensory strategies using color, pattern, and views to nature and access to nature. Um, the uh, Lady Salento Hospital in Australia, designed by Lyons and Conrad Gargett, is a children's hospital, and it's just this riot of color and pattern and texture on the exterior and inside, and it really, you know, changes how people view hospitals. Um, 
it used evidence-based design principles and concepts of salutogenic design to create a healing environment for children. But inside, the daylight qualities are amazing. There's loads of natural light, big windows, not the typical things that you would associate with a hospital environment, and these multi-sensory spaces, integrated artwork, views up and through the building. So they were really trying to challenge the impersonal decor of a, of a typical hospital and reconsider how they can promote, really get people's attention, promote wayfinding, um, create a more emotionally supportive space for children. And I think the, the next image showing each of the main therapy spaces has this connected and related outdoor space. This idea of really integrating therapy environments and outdoors um, is it's part of their environmental strategy with natural ventilation, but it's part of their architectural and health promoting strategy as well to put people at ease and make people comfortable. And another, another aspect of super architecture is the multifunctional qualities that good architecture has. Most architects are trying to do a lot with a little. So multifunctional design, things that serve multiple purposes, that produce co-benefits for people and our environment, are, are very important. And the, the last example I'm, I'm going to show you is um, by Steve L. Anderson, uh, SLA Architects in Copenhagen, uh, which some, I know some of you know. Um, this. This project is one of a series of these cloudburst projects that are happening in the city of Copenhagen. So it's an attempt to take the necessary climate adaptation strategies and connect them to park spaces and productive <coughs> outdoor spaces so that the uh, climate adaptation has added benefits to people. So this is the, one of the first in a series of projects that are going to happen. Um, and in this case, the, the aim is to create an attractive and child-friendly landscape capable of capturing and delaying 18,000 uh, cubic meters of rainwater to prevent flooding and um, lessen the pressure on the sewage system. And this, this uh, example here in Korsgal will be transformed into a cloudburst street. So they know it's going to flood, they're designing where it will flood and creating spaces that people will, will benefit from and co-designing what kinds of environments people want with local communities and local schools. And Steele L. Anderson, the principal uh, who contributed to this AD, he said, it's about, the ex it's about the extra benefits we get from climate adaptation. The blue, the green, the health, the active and the social, in short, all that makes the city worth living. So he argues that climate adaptation in itself it, it needs much more. It needs this, this human interaction, the social qualities and dimensions. And I think that's, that's the heart of, of super architecture. And as I said, this is a, one of a number of, of climate adaptation initiatives that the city is going to be um, implementing in the coming years. And interestingly, they awarded these contracts by competition. So it, they treated it really as a design, a design competition to make these small interventions. Um, uh, to create spaces for people in the city while also um, help the risk of flooding. So I often uh, use the daylight as such a wonderful way of framing the ideas of super architecture and how we can create places for people that are using less energy, doing more for us multifunctionally. So um, the, the daylight in homes is a, is a research area of mine. And one of the best examples, I think, is, is the Active House um, a series of, of projects, uh, which Meg will talk about uh, in a moment. Um, but I think daylight is it's a fundamental aspect of architecture. It's a fundamental aspect of sustainable design, and also in promoting health and well-being. To go back to the, the Cure Cottages, I mean, daylight is really important to us. So. The creative design of natural light and buildings is kind of a, it's an easy win. It's a win-win it's a in terms of positive benefits for people. Um, 
And this example, um, instead of me presenting the work of the active houses, we're lucky enough to have Meg Graham, one of the designers of, of Toronto's active house. So um, I'm, I'm going to hand the, the mic over to Meg in a moment, and uh, I'm just going to introduce her first. So Hello, people were standing in the back. There's a this couple of seats down here that you can grab. <laughs> Um, so, Meg Graham is a licensed architect and principal at Supercool here in Toronto. Um, recognized as a leading Canadian architecture practice, Supercool's <coughs> commitment to design excellence and advanced building technologies has resulted in numerous awards and the extensive publication of the practice, both locally and abroad. And since 2001, uh, Meg has taught design here at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. And she's been a visiting lecturer and critic at numerous architecture schools in Canada and the United States. Uh, Meg is a past chair of the Toronto Society of Architects and is a member of the City of Toronto Design Review Panel, the Board of Directors at University of Toronto Schools, and the Harvard University Graduate School of Design Alumni Council. So we're very lucky to have Meg here to talk about the design of the active houses. So, So I have a confession to make. I actually, my partner Andre designed, uh, did, did most of the work on the active houses. So don't ask me any technical questions because we won't get there. But I, I'd like to start off by saying um, one of the things, I just get so inspired by coming to these TSA lectures. I haven't been to a lot of them recently because we have two small children that run my life. But, but right now, I mean, I have to say like the kind of uh, what, what you're showing in, in the discussion around co-benefits um, and of, of sustainability and beauty, which is what I'm going to talk to you more. Um, or I, I found the images that you show, the projects that you show is really inspiring, Terry, so thank you for that. And it made me think, too, when you were talking about daylight and about, um, and projects that, 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 you know, we all know and what it is that we're seeking as architects to in, inject into these projects that we do every day, whether they be, and super cool as a practice, we do all sorts of types of buildings. We do multi-unit residential, we are doing a couple projects for U of T, we do single family homes, we do office buildings, everything, the whole nine yards. But I have to say the thing that comes, you know, one of the things obviously that comes up the, predominantly and the most is, is about this kind of uh, ability to live well and to work well and to play well and these things that tie us like, back to our environment, these things that make us feel well. I had a call with a potential client this morning and she was talking, she, I said, what do you want most? It was about a house and she said, what do you, I said, what are you really looking for? What do you want most? She said, I want a house of windows and I said, oh my God, that's such a beautiful way of putting it and I think you know, and, and Terry and I are working on a top secret project right now that I can't, we can't talk, but it's about the architecture of happiness and how do we infuse uh, a kind of, those basic principles and tenets of design that we all know so well and that we try every day assiduously to inject into our projects, into those, the, the, some of those, pro, those type, building typologies that become, can become so banal through a process of value engineering and zoning and all the rigors that, that projects are, to which they're subject. Um, and, and re-inject that in there to really push the envelope, uh, push the envelope on that and recapture that architecture of happiness um, or the happiness that we all uh, know that we want in, in our projects or that we hope to get. So back to the idea of um, sustainability and beauty and the Active House program. We were approached by Great Gulf, and I, I'm struggling to remember when, I think it was 2010, to do the first Active House in Canada. So the Active House is a metric that is very much not just about the kind of environmental sustainability of a uh, house, but also very much about the kind of its livability and its, its health for the occupants, so indoor uh, health, but also state of mind. Very much interested in all those things. Now, and, and Great Golf is uh, the largest, I believe they're the largest uh, home developer in Canada, certainly a very active group. They have multi-unit residential as well as the low-rise division. So we were thrilled. Let me just say we were thrilled to be approached uh, by them because really what they, they were seeking to do was something quite ambitious and I don't know that anybody's ever really, like it's, it's hard, ultimately you have to stand back and take a look at it to understand that in a way it's really a benchmark or a kind of paradigm uh, for uh, residential development, mass residential development in Canada because really again what it, the goal 
through this program and, and understanding that mass um, residential development is very much about the kind of numbers ultimately like it's about achieving you know good living conditions at a, at a lower price for more people and so there's a, there's a lot of good in that but how do you you know is it possible to push the envelope on that and from a business perspective remain uh, competitive with all the other uh, developers and builders out there but again goal to create healthier and more comfortable lives for the occupants without impacting ne ne negatively on the climate so it was a design and this is this is this is the thorough this is the first active house we did with them we've done two um, this is the community into which this new building uh, was, this new house was going to be uh, inserted. So it was very much a collaboration with Great Gulf around creating this new benchmark or new paradigm. Uh, a design focused on natural daylight and ventilation, uh, thermal comfort, indoor air quality, uh, reduced water consumption, energy efficiency and performance, and responsible sourcing and construction techniques. Um, some of the eco, uh, like uh, sustainability features from a more structural perspective included prefab uh, panel construction, dual zone HVAC, operable skylights, and a home automation set, uh, system. But, but the thing that, I mean, it doesn't look like an eco house. And I think that that's the thing that ultimately for us, you know, it, it, it's entirely, we're, we're entirely capable in all the houses that we do as a practice of, of getting this level to them when they're bespoke. But the idea that we could make something that's just as beautiful as some of the other homes we make um, at, for, at a low, lower price point for a greater segment of the market was really interesting to us. And ultimately, of course, it was really interesting to Great Gulf. At Supercool, what we're mo like the things that we're primarily concerned with are, <coughs> excuse me, durability, constructability, and then just the basic tenets of good design, which is to say, good massing, good proportions, and as much light as possible. And this is really what we were able to achieve. Um, there are, I think, 17 skylights in the home, which is unusual, of course, uh, operable. So there's this whole stack effect that is created throughout the house. Great flow through. We were also really concerned with those things that we were concerned with. Um, on, on other half, like on, on the bespoke homes that we do too, which is to say you come in the front door, you can see all the way through to the back. Having grown up in a spec house in Mississauga, I know my mother's still complaining about the fact that they've never actually opened up the back wall and the house faces the wrong direction. I mean, it's, it's something that is so basic and, and I think uh, essential to the way that we plan houses, uh, any house, that, that to me, you know, in a, in a way, it's a sh like, ultimately it's, not, it's more than a shame that we don't do it more often. Um, a few more pictures of this one here, uh, the upper story, uh, the washroom, and then rolling on to the, and I should, I should be quiet now, should, I should stop, I'm, I'm over time. This is Active House 2. So the first one was built in Thorold, which is near St. Catharines. This is Active House 2, which was built actually in Etobicoke. Um, in near Centennial Park. So this one improves, in fact, upon the energy performance of its predecessor, claiming the designation of the first certified active house actually in the world. Um, working again with uh, Great Gulf, we designed, this is, so this is a two-story, three-bedroom family home in Etobicoke, smaller than the other one. This one's, I think, closer to 2,400 square feet, um, using sustainable design strategies that minimize energy consumption and maximize occupant comfort. Again, it was really important to deviate from the typical house model. And I'll say with both of these, we had to work within design guidelines that were set by the community. So what we, we tried, you know, we re worked within them but reinterpreted them because, of, of course, these are not what the ones next door look like. Um, we did, so, sorry. <coughs> Uh, the open plan, plan configuration and abundance of um, double height spaces here are so they're they're enhanced by specific energy saving and environmentally conscious features such as uh, LED lighting systems inside and out, triple gate glazing, low flow water fixtures, low uh, VOC finishes in energy performance monitoring systems, which ultimately are not essential, but they're they're you know this is a demonstration project to some extent, uh, so a, a lovely thing to have. And these are all, though, complementary to the primary design strategy of maximizing opportunities for natural daylight and ventilation, and ultimately achieving a greater sense of health and well-being for the occupants. So they've been they've been quite successful. I mean, the first one actually did sell. The second one, I think, sold as well. But the first one, I mean, they, you know, it did quite it did quite well. The folks who moved into it were quite happy about it and paid a little bit more ultimately than you would for. Uh, the, ha the other houses in the neighborhood. But very simple, like you can see here, what we did was we just like, just carved out this very simple, it's not even a courtyard, it's like an indent, but that was all about bringing in that, as much natural light and, and you know, more views through uh, the house than you would normally have in a, in a typical footprint for, for a uh, house in this development.
And there you go, the view to the backyard. So in a lot of ways, very simple. But, but again, around those very elemental and basic principles of good light, uh, access to uh, natural ventilation, and, and great proportions on the inside as well. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. That was really interesting. I always think of, it's like a camouflage house. You wouldn't know that's, you go there to visit, and you think, which one is it? You know, it's, <laughs> it's disguised, an eco house in disguise. Um, Okay, our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is uh, Robin Gwenther. So, sorry if that was surprising. Uh, so, Robin is a principal at Perkins and Will and a senior advisor to Healthcare Without Harm. Um, an expert in sustainable healthcare design. Uh, Robin is a longtime advocate for healthier healing environments and recently spoke on the topic at TEDMED 2014. Um, her notable projects include leading the major expansion of Lucille Picard Children's Hospital at Stanford and ongoing work at preeminent pre institutions such as the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And Robin also led one of two winning teams in the Kaiser Permanente Small Hospital Big Idea Competition. Healthcare Design Magazine named her the number one most influential designer in healthcare, and she coordinated the Green Guide for Healthcare, which is really a, a very important publication in the industry, and it's the most commonly used method for tracking sustainability in healthcare spaces today. Uh, so she released the second edition of her wonderful book, Sustainable Healthcare Architecture, in 2013. So if you're interested in, in sustainable healthcare architecture, this is the book to get. It's a wonderful uh, book. And Fast Company named her as one of the 100 most creative people in business. So thank you very much for coming to talk to us today, Robin. And over to you. So I am not going to talk so much about healthcare tonight, um, but I will answer any questions people have about healthcare. I actually want to take a kind of journey through this question of health and the built environment. And, and say that when I had the opportunity to work with Terry on the AD issue, I think this sort of started me on a journey of thinking about how we as architects are really just beginning to get familiar with this topic of designing healthier buildings and what that means. So I like to sort of go back to what is health and really recognize, as Terry pointed out, that it's much more than um, the absence of disease. It's really this broader state of maybe happiness, if we want to talk about what Meg's now writing about, but, but really the idea of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And if we begin to think about what that means in the built environment and what it means in healthcare, this is a healthcare slide. This is US data, but it's probably not very different in other industrialized nations. That, that what we have are the sickest people using, the sickest 5% of people using 50% of healthcare resources. And you know, the next 15 to 35 having some level of risk, but 60 to 80% of the population, actually the goal is to just keep people healthy. And, and so how do we actually think about that in the built environment, and how do we think about that when we're designing healthcare spaces? How do healthcare organizations think about those statistics? How do we begin to really see our buildings as serving a prevention goal, being for the bottom of the pyramid? And I, for a long time, have been thinking that um, we have to begin to use health as our inspiration to change architecture. And that we can, if, if it's true that every innovation begins with an inspiration, then health needs to be our inspiration in this generation of architecture to really transform built environments. And, and I like to talk about Wendell Berry, who's a kind of farmer and philosopher in the US, He's written some really interesting essays like, What is Health? And he talks about that when health is the aim, good solutions act the way a healthy organ acts within the body. 
that good solutions fix problems without making new ones, that good solutions create cascading series of benefits instead of externalizing a bunch of unintended negative consequences. And I would argue that some of the work that, you, that Terry just showed, the Scandinavian work, is really about trying to do that. It's about trying to find solutions that create these other benefits. You want to manage stormwater? You can either build bigger retention ponds underground, or you can turn that into something that delivers other co-benefits. Now, in architecture now, people talk a lot about regenerative design. And they talk about this idea that architecture is moving to solutions that try to create those co-benefits. That they're moving beyond kind of sustainability as doing less harm, using less energy, using less water, using f less materials, to actually built environments that create cascading sets of benefits. But when people talk about regenerative design, they don't often talk about how we're going to get from the current built reality that we all are practicing in to that kind of nirvana when every house is built the way Meg's house are built. And I think it's health, that health is the way to propel ourselves from the left-hand side of this diagram to the right-hand side of the diagram. So, um, the problem is that at the left-hand side of the diagram, it operates at every scale of the built environment. And, and this transformation often requires us to deal with unintended consequences that are displaced both in space and in time. And that's really what I want to spend the next 12 or 14 minutes talking to you guys about and really look at all the scales in which the built environment impacts health. The longest chapter is this one on materials because it's often the one that people spend the least amount of time on in architecture. That we don't really understand how our material choices negatively impact health. And this question of can we create a building materials economy that supports health? ecosystem health, human health. And what we have to do to our materials economy to get there is really a profound question for everyone practicing today. The US Green Building Council said this, that the effects of millions of material choices have massive consequences for ecosystem and human health. So how do we change that statement into the effects of millions in material choices supports ecosystem and human health? Like, how do we, how do, we do that? And, and I'm going to kind of walk you through how we have to think about it to do that. And recognize that buildings right now are responsible for more than 50% of the extraction that takes place on the planet. Whether it's bauxite, like making aluminum, which is bauxite mining on the left, or so what you would call a non-renewable resource, or it's timber production, um, which we all know in North America, we do a lot of timber production. It's more than 50% of transport globally, moving these materials around from point A to point B with all the fossil fuel and energy consequences of transport. Obviously, we have ecosystem degradation associated with building materials. We are heating, beating, and treating these materials. We're making water pollution. We're degrading habitat. We are mining. We are extracting everywhere on the planet. And increasingly, we're doing that extraction a long way from where we're actually using these materials. And we forget that around all that extraction and all that manufacturing are fence line communities who bear the health consequences of that. This slide is of Cancer Alley in Louisiana, which is home to 150 petrochemical manufacturing plants. 91% of people who live in those communities have some kind of health issue linked to chemical exposure. 
But you know, when we use these materials, photos of people like this are not on the box. Like we don't see that when we're sitting in our offices specking this stuff. And then actually, we rarely reuse buildings at the end of life. We actually are kind of pulling out about 30% of building materials when we pull it out to be beneficially reused because we're not designing for disassembly. And we um, basically are downcycling still most of the building products. But that's what we have to think about because the buildings we build today, because resource extraction is happening faster and faster, and is now exceeding every level of kind of responsible production. That we have to understand that every material that we put in the building today, our grandchildren are gonna harvest for their buildings. And so what is in building materials does matter, and it does have a legacy. So I want you to think about what things are made of. So what do you think this carpet's made of? This is what this carpet is made of. Sort of standard broadloom carpet, nylon, six, okay? In other words, it's made from this. It's a petrochemically based building material. Petrochemically based building materials now are everywhere in buildings. Every spec section everywhere, right? And there's really two problems. The first problem is that in order to take a flammable material like oil, turn it into a building product that we don't want to burn in a fire, right? We have to add all this stuff, not to mention the performance differences between window treatments and adhesives, or window treatments and insulation. So we have all these chemical soup. And then the other problem is, of course, that we don't know what's in anything. This is a paint label from a Home Depot paint. There's no ingredients on this label. So none of us know anything about the materials that we're putting in buildings. And now we know that we have all this chemical exposure, that we have increasing body burdens in people, and um, and that these chemicals are in all of us from when we are born. So what, what are we doing about this? Well, we're trying to get people to disclose ingredients, right? Like we all need to join the huge market transformation called let's disclose what's in our building products if we care about health. And, um, you know, at, and so this is actually taking off now. Major manufacturers, I'm sure you're seeing environmental product declarations, health product declarations, people beginning to do this. At Perkins and Will, we developed this precautionary list of 25 substances that we don't think should be in building materials anymore. Um, you're all welcome to use this list. You can get it on your iPhones or your, your Android devices um, and begin to kind of participate in this. In order to actually make people think about this more, because we live in a world of designers who care about beauty and don't want to be chemists, we sort of develop these sort of material rules in a way based on Michael Pollan's food rules to begin to sort of shift people's mindsets about using materials in buildings. And we have this series of posters. Just because almost anything can kill you doesn't mean building products should. Right? Nice, interesting things for us all to think about. Pay more, use less. That's sort of the lesson of your active houses, I think, right? Better materials, less material. Carbohydrate-based materials. And design for disassembly. And the things you can imagine in their raw and natural state. And last, to really start regarding space age materials with skepticism, and there is no better place for those materials than in healthcare environments. We have believed in the performance attributes of this stuff until we have surrounded everybody with 
with just a chemical soup. So um, we are seeing people in healthcare starting to not do that anymore and beginning to pull back on some of this and say it's time to think about health at that scale. So next I want to move to the building scale and just touch on that a little bit. So can our buildings create the underlying conditions for people to thrive, to be happy? And, and you know, th it's important to recognize that it's really only been in about the last 40 years that we have spent our lives indoors. And nowadays, I love to use this, so this photo of um, a Gaylord Opryland Hotel because nowadays we fool ourselves between what is indoors and outdoors. Like if you go into a restaurant in the Gaylord Opryland, they ask you if you want to sit outside, but you're not outside, you're under that dome. So we don't even necessarily know anymore when we're indoors and outdoors because we blurred the lines so much. And, and when Wired Magazine called me up after I did some testimony to the National Academy of Sciences and wrote this article about, about you know, that we're all living in this massive real-time microbial experiment in buildings because we don't really know what impact this is having on our microbes and our microbial environment or really how, how it's all, what's happening in the buildings. And, and you know, when you sort of look at a, a standard office space, you can see all this stuff. I mean, it looks just like that patient room, right? So how do we begin to take this apart and think about um, designing healthful spaces? Because people want to be healthy. People want to be well. And employers know that people who are healthy have lower health care costs, they like their jobs more, and they change jobs less. So actually having healthy workplaces does have a return on investment to employers, to school children, et cetera. And, and this it, article that came out in Environmental Health Perspectives um, was really the first one that sort of said green buildings actually support better cognitive functioning than not green buildings. So now there's, there's more and more emerging data like that that will tell you that, whether you're in healthcare buildings or workplaces or schools, any building that you want, it matters. And, and um, you know, at the Packer Children's Hospital, which I just finished, I put two photos in here, I think maybe three photos. This is actually a garden over the operating room, but the next photo I'm gonna show you is three spaces that all relate to this garden in very different ways. The one on the left are spaces that look at the garden. The middle photo is a staff stair that actually is behind that glass, so people actually are traversing the stair in daylight, and by the way, with this sort of frit natural pattern on the glass that both screens the direct sun, but also makes people feel a little more like they're walking in nature. And then the third one are the skylights up into that garden from the recovery room. So we can do a better job of connecting our buildings to natural, be, beyond even residential buildings, our healthcare buildings, et cetera, to these kind of forces. And last, communities. Can the buildings restore the natural systems they are sitting in? And can we create conditions for communities to thrive? by how we site and create urban built environments. And this is really where the question of, of the, um, the fossil fuel impacts of the built environment really comes into play. Uh, there's more and more research and there's more and more data on this. And when Metropolis said in 2004, architects pollute, they really weren't kidding. That we, we have to own the fact that it's almost half the carbon emissions are from the built environment. And that those carbon emissions, those carbon emissions 
are really harming everybody's health. And um, it's interesting that, that the Lancet says now um, air pollution is the most important risk factor for mortality at a population level. It's now actually pollution is responsible for 15 times as many deaths as war and forms of violence. So it is now the issue, the public health issue. And, and now you're, we're finding out that air pollution and osteoporosis are linked. So all these issues around the built environment are impacting people's health. Then you get into the whole question of economic disinvestment. And, and neighborhood infrastructure and community trauma impacting people's health, the social and economic health of communities. So you see deteriorated environments, unhealthy public spaces, unhealthy products, are all the kind of adverse experiences that create trauma at a community level. So how do we as architects begin to rebuild communities, to recover from this. Um, and whether it's you know, deteriorated urban infrastructure that's reimagined, like in the Atlanta Beltline, or, or even just reading the urban landscape more for its health promotion. Um, it's all the ways in which we do that. And I'm ending with this idea that we have to remember that health is more than physical, that all these social determinants, all of this works together, and that architecture and design is kind of at the root of about 80% of this stuff. So we actually all have a big hand in this conversation. Dick Jackson, public health doctor, said, how we design the built environment holds potent, tremendous potential for addressing and preventing many of the nation's current public health concerns at one or more of those scales. And so I want to close by saying I want us all to remember that we are all designers of world health. Thanks. Uh, really puts these in perspective, these big ideas that we're talking about, so I think that's really great. Um, our next speaker is um, Terry Montgomery. Uh, so Terry is a founding partner of Montgomery Size of Architects with over 40 years experience in the design um, of a range of institutional buildings. A leader in designing for clients with unique needs, he is pioneering new models in health services for youth adults and seniors balancing operational efficiency with a sense of holistic well-being for clients and families. His notable projects include the South Down Institute, the St. Jobs Rehab at Sunnybrook Health Services, and the Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital, for which he received the Circle of Honor Award in 2009. His current projects include a major addition to Greenwood College School in Toronto, and an addition and renovation to Waterloo Lutheran Seminary at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. So thank you very much for coming today, Terry. Uh, I'll get right into it. Uh, what do I mean by in between, by the in between? I mean, I'm really talking about hospital planning and I'm talking about the spaces that are in between the clinical programs. Uh, I mean, if you like, it's, it's almost like, I like to think of them as the civic spaces in a hospital. Uh, or in analogy with the city, you know, you think of the streets are actually the in-between spaces. I think someone said that, uh, that uh, the spaces in between buildings are more important than the buildings themselves. And I'd like to argue that the spaces in between clinical programmatic spaces are at least as important as those spaces are themselves. Uh, so you've probably, I don't know if you've been in a hospital recently, you've probably found yourself in one of those in between spaces, uh, probably at the worst possible time, where uh, you know a space that is kind of 
hardly restorative, more, uh, you know, no view to the outside, uh, terrible lighting, materials, everything, losing your way. I mean, we find ourselves in such places in hospitals all the time. And uh, I mean, what, and yet, where do we actually want a restorative environment more than in a, where do we need it more? Where are we desperate for it than, than in a hospital? So, I mean, that's, that's what's interesting to me. Uh, I think what, uh, you know, why is it like this? Why, why is it so? Well, I think there's many reasons, but I think one of the reasons is the, the, the process in designing a hospital. Basically, we rely on a functional program or a brief that, and on user groups who actually develop, help to develop that brief. And that brief privileges the clinical spaces, probably for good reason. But <coughs> often, they end up being a, a much more important priority because they have so many very complex relationships <coughs> that the in-between spaces, the circulation, the, the public spaces, let's call them the civic spaces, actually get pushed aside. And I think that although we are seeing changes in this way of thinking now, uh, that is, that's probably one of the reasons that the hospitals are the way they are. So certainly the challenge for us is how do we inject into a hospital planning process uh, places that are restorative? I mean, all the things that we've been talking about this evening, natural light, sh opportunity to go outside, materials, water, plants, all those things, it's really hard to inject those into the hospital plan. Uh, I think it's interesting for us, and we used to kind of joke about it, but I think hospital environments really started to deteriorate when they invented antibiotics. Uh, sort of the combination of antibiotics and uh, mechanical ventilation really had a hard time, it really uh, was hard on hospital environments. And I think penicillin was invented in 1928, and I think it was first used in the early 40s. And that's just around the time when, we, when you look at old hospitals, you'll see the courtyards, the fountains, the, the big lobbies, the gardens, the transoms, the opening windows, they all disappeared. So that we hit a point in the 60s and the 70s when uh, none of those things were in our hospitals. Uh, so what we've done, actually, my partners and I, we've we spent time looking at that pre-modern medical science. What did the buildings look like? What were they like? And we actually have discovered, all of us as we travel, a number of places that are quite remarkable in terms of restorative settings. And in fact, so that we've often looked at those when we're trying to design our, our hospitals. So now I'm going to change the slide. Uh, let me see if I'm going to do this. So that's actually an ad for, uh, uh, I guess it's a mental health hospital, really, in the south of France from 1889 that advertises uh, uh, plentiful gardens and shade. That's it for treatment. That's all they talk about, but that's really all they're focused on. And so then if we look at that, Vincent van Gogh actually checked himself in in this hospital in 1889. And he painted that picture of that courtyard, which all of the things we've been talking about tonight, about restorative, about plants, about covered shade, colonnades, water, all of those kind of restorative uh, health and well-being things uh, are depicted in the painting. Imagine a hospital that inspires you to paint. Uh, and he did a lot of paintings when he was here. Uh, and that's what it looks like now. My partner, David, uh, has to be acknowledged for taking this picture. But uh, so, I mean, again, the lovely thing about these, these spaces is that they endure forever. They never, their function never changes. They're always uh, important. Uh, so that idea of a space having multiple use and enduring. Uh, so how do, we, how do we inject something like that into a hospital? So now I'm going to show you uh, four projects quickly uh, where we've actually tried to uh, 
to chip away at this and do some of these things. This is uh, the South Down Institute in Newmarket. It's actually uh, an addiction and mental health, a mental tr health treatment center for uh, religious people, people that live in religious communities. Uh, it's, uh, it's, got a bit, uh, it's a residential facility. People stay there about three months, and uh, it's, uh, it's for about 40 people. Uh, it's north of the city. So in a way, in many ways, this is not a tricky one for us because it already aligns with the values of, this, of the building that I showed you from the 1880s. Searching for a healthy setting outside of the city, uh, that whole idea of a, of, of a kind of uh, retreat uh, being good for, in nature, being good for health. Uh, but it's just, just outside of the creeping suburbia and new market. So here, here's the plan. I mean, what really inspired us here wasn't the functional program. It was actually a stand of white pine trees on the site that uh, we couldn't ignore. And so we designed the plan, making a courtyard not unlike the San Remy Hospital, uh, around those pine trees. And so just as important as the courtyard itself is the, is the single loaded corridor, I like to call it a gallery, uh, around that. Single loaded corridors are wonderful things and really hard to do in healthcare. So the, and the other, there's another important thing here, which is when you enter the building, you see right through it. And for us, in all of the healthcare projects we do, that's an incredibly important thing. So that rather than just seeing the depth and the kind of monotony of the institution itself, you see the whole therapeutic setting, which includes the outside. So you can see that this is the chapel, the main entry, and then all of these things, uh, group rooms, administration, dining, are all grouped around this one place. Uh, which is the, really the symbolic and the functional heart of the place. So here we are, this is uh, the entrance, looking out towards the pine tree to the, to the courtyard. Uh, the chance to go outside, the natural light, the views, and the greenery are all there. This is uh, the kind of breakout area and it's outside the treatment rooms. Uh, the dining room, which still has a view out to that courtyard. Everything working around that, that one space. Finally, that is the courtyard itself, which uh, of course has a big terrace in it for summer use, uh, under the white pines. Finally, the chapel, it's the only space actually that doesn't look directly into the courtyard. It has that low window, because the idea here is to focus away to the south through that stained glass screen, which came from the previous building. So that's the first, the first example. And it's pretty easy, because it didn't have that complex set of clinical relationships that had to be met. So the idea of introducing a single loaded corridor in a courtyard uh, was pretty easy for us to do. The next project is a little bit harder. This is a rehab hospital, again, outside of Toronto, uh, an addition to this rehab hospital. This is the, uh, the plan of the site. I mean, it's an interesting site because it was actually the hospital was started by the Sisters of St. John the Divine, uh, again, searching for a site for convalescence outside of the city, similar a little bit to the, uh, the South Down. Uh, so they bought a large farm up uh, north of Finch and Bayview and, and built this first hospital. And you can see it's got all the right things about it, as far as I'm concerned. It's got this lovely in, uh, entry drive, which is uh, got uh, crab apple trees on either side an entry court, a very slender building, and slenderness is important here, uh, that looks out onto a courtyard that then looks out onto the, the, uh, the property, the greenery and the gardens. About, well, in the 1970s, the 1970s was a bad time for health and architecture. This building was gone. And there they actually took the, 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 uh, the inpatient bedrooms and put them right into the garden, leaving all the internal, all the kind of in-between spaces are in here, completely locked into that building. So, there's, so it's completely lost touch with the garden. So that then this is the building that we have, which is a, a outpatient rehab uh, piece. 
Uh, again, we tried to pick up on the slenderness of this, the idea that the building included a porch, an immediate view of the garden, and then uh, and a, and a gallery around that, around that garden. So if you look at another picture of this, here we're zeroing in on this, but you can see that that's the big kind of healthcare piece that includes a rehab gym and a lot of offices. One of those big program pieces that, uh, that is pretty demanding. You can't really do a lot with it. So what was important for us, though, was to create an infrastructure that included the entry porch, it's accessible, that view through the building into the garden, and then this, as important as the garden itself, is this colonnade or single loaded corridor or gallery which surrounds this, this courtyard. Again, we see all of these pieces as never, never becoming obsolete. Maybe one day they might take this piece off and do another one. But that these civic places in the building can, can endure. There is a section through it, again, slenderness being the key. This, this actually deals with the change in grade by grading up to the entrance, which we didn't do before, an entry porch, a view through, a lantern, which really adds even more light to this entry space, and then a view of a stair so that you can fully comprehend the fact that there's a level change inside the building. That became obscured in that original view when you first come in, the stair in the garden, uh, another view with the lantern in the foreground, again now inside that rehab gym looking out to the gallery, which is of course being used for, for rehab even though it wasn't planned as such. It's the best place to be. Okay, next. There is a view from the back of the uh, courtyard in the garden. Now this is a, a project from a few years ago, Blue View Kids Rehab, which is a, a children's rehab hospital, sort of the center for children's rehab in, in Ontario. Uh, it's a huge resource. It has 75 inpatient beds. It's got a huge outpatient program. It's a, got a school, uh, uh, all kinds of research, a research department, a clinical technology department that makes prothesis. And it's also got a public recreational pool cafeteria, uh, all kinds of things in this building. And uh, but the, the, I only want to focus on one piece, which is this. Because in a sense, again connecting to things that we've talked about before, <coughs> we've seen the, we sort of understand the building as a portal to the ravine. The ravine being the lungs of the city. And if you just look at it here, you can see that that's that little piece, which is an in-between the two blocks of the building as a well between the residential part of the city and, and this huge, vast ravine in the city, which is quite lovely. Uh, so the building really, I mean, these are big healthcare floor, floor plates that are all generated by the inpatient floors. Hard to, hard to cope with. They're, they're thick building plates. So we tried to put as many things in this little in-between piece as we could so that it would benefit uh, the whole building. So there, is, there it is again, this little piece, which bridges between the, the houses in the city and the ravine here in the gardens. There is the section through this tiny piece, slender again, slender as we can make it. Uh, it ends up being a bridge between the two halves of the building. Uh, those two halves are generated by the way the inpatients break up between two levels of care. But you can see this piece has all kinds of uh, good things in it. This is the lobby, uh, a kind of compressed space where you go to the left or the right. This big, great room, which is on the ravine with these huge windows out to the ravine, again, that chance to see out of the building as soon as you come into it. Uh, then on the second level, an, uh, an outpatient clinic with a view to a green roof here. Third level, uh, the children's play playroom adjacent to an outdoor space. A series of, of single loaded gallery spaces with meeting rooms. Finally, the, the, uh, the boardroom on the upper level. So, I mean, it, this is strategically located. So anytime you're in the building, you pretty much have to go through this space. 
Uh, it's no good to add these kinds of spaces around the edges where nobody's there. The important thing is to get them into the middle of there. So let's just see what, what's happening here. So there it is, uh, dusk, this, this big piece. I mean, it becomes a kind of lantern for the building. Uh, I mean, for us, it was important as a gateway, so we didn't actually put the entrance through it. We wanted it to be completely transparent. Uh, this is a covered porch that kind of leads you to the first outdoor space in the sequence, which becomes a kind of symbolic porch for the building. It's also a place where the, uh, the wheel trans trucks bring children. Uh, this is inside the building now. We're coming into the lobby, the reception area. Again, because these are civic places, we use materials that uh, relate to the, to the outside, durable materials that will last a long time. And then, and then the double height space with the connection to the ravine. Uh, a view looking north to the ravine. Uh, I mean, what's, again, that idea that once you make a space like this, it seems to find all kinds of uses. Unlike the clinical spaces that are designed for a very particular use, these are used in many ways, as, as our streets. This is the outpatient uh, waiting area, which looks up uh, south again. Here we are on that roof terrace adjacent to the playroom. Again, it ends up having uses that we never imagined, so it can be used as an event place. Uh, and then that's a view from of the length from, from the back of the building to the north. Of course, it's possible to have all that glazing because of the, its north light. And then finally, the gallery space on one of the levels up above. This is a kind of a, a, a shading device made of uh, stained glass, which casts images on the floor. Finally, the boardroom on the fifth level, which looks in both directions and actually has a painting of the, of the, of the gardens. OK, so that's, there's one more project. It's very much, as you can see, uh, in the early design stages. Uh, but it's different than all of those. And it's, uh, it's called a Seniors Health and Wellness Village. And I guess the challenge for us is to make it a health and wellness village rather than just a long-term care project. And that's the challenge. Uh, See, it's got uh, communal spaces on the ground floor and then three floors of, of uh, resident areas above. And there's the plan. I mean, we're inspired by some Austrian architects. The thing about long-term care is that the inhabitants can't really go anywhere. So they, so I mean, the tradition is that they're actually centered around uh, the care station or the, the healthcare services. The trick for us was to center them around their own community. We've now gone to such an extreme of making all, all private rooms that people have lost that sense of community. So for us, the important thing was to emphasize the community and to try to bring light and outdoor space and greenery to that community. So the whole plan is predicated, it's a kind of map predicated on that idea. So there is one of these, uh, one of these little groupings of, of bedrooms around their own common space. Uh, the, they're, they're, the, this is this little atrium in the middle of that space, two terraces. So the idea is to be able to cluster them around their shared space and still have natural light views and greenery in the center. That's what we've been struggling with. Uh, there you can see the section going back, similar to the blue view section, where, where we're trying to make things as slender as they can be. Uh, with this atrium, and then the terraces, uh, and this kind of shared communal space in the middle. Finally, this is, these are the architects that have inspired us. This is the internal atrium, which the care areas are gathered around. I mean, it raises lots of questions for me. I mean, I think we've debated whether that should be covered or not. And I think we've landed on the idea of covering it, as these people did, partly because of the seasons partly because it's so small. And I guess uh, it leaves us with a lot of questions, whether in fact it will bring that restorative quality into the center of that grouping, uh, or whether the fact that it's going to be covered will make it more of that ambiguous, is it outdoors or is it indoor kind of space. So that's it. Uh, thank you. 
our next speaker is uh, Professor Stephen Verderer. Um, Stephen is a scholar and researcher and a registered architect whose core specialization is design therapeutics and health. Um, he's a professor here at the John H. Daniels um, School of uh, Architecture, Landscape and Design and also at the Dalalana School of Public Health here at the University of Toronto. Um, he holds a doctorate in architecture from the University of Michigan and is the co-founder of R2 Arc uh, Los Angeles and New Orleans. Um, he's authored more than 90 peer-reviewed journal and conference publications and eight books. Um, his most recent book is Innovations in Behavioral Health Architecture, uh, which released this year. And this evening, he'll present recent work on the repurposing of existing host structures as pop-up clinics for implementation in both pre- and post-disaster urban contexts. Thanks, Stephen. Welcome. <clears throat> Welcome to our new home here at the, of the Daniels faculty at One Spadina on the University of Toronto campus. So I don't know, this might be the first time that some of you are here. Um, Thank you, Terry, for putting this together also. So this is, um, this is an article in the AD special issue that Terry edited. It's called Architects as First Responders, Portable Healthcare Architecture in a Climate-Altered World. Um, so it's a brief overview of a, a series of types of, um, of modular uh, prefabricated healthcare architecture that can be used in the aftermath of disasters. Um, Terry, could you give me that, my notes there for a second? <laughs> Excuse me. Thanks. There are five. Um, the article briefly, it's a summary of a book that I published in um, 2016 called Innovations in Transportable Healthcare Architecture, which is part of a four book series for, published by Rutledge. And Terry mentioned the fourth book, which just came out this last week on behavioral health architecture. Um, the first book was on, uh, it's called Innovations in Hospice Architecture, and the second book's called Innovations in Hospital Architecture. So now it stands as a four volume set. Um, so um, this, is, this is a summarization of part of that third book in the series. You see this image here, this is from 1943 in North Africa. This is a truck that becomes, a trans it transforms into a, a tent clinic for a triage out in the battlefield of North Africa in the Second War. And the article talks about five um, types. There are tent-based tent systems, which go back a very long time in recorded history, back to the ancient yurts. <clears throat> and the second type is vehicular nomadic clinics. There's an example shown on the upper right, which was a proposal from Horde Copeland Mock with uh, Monarch Corporation. It's a mobile field hospital developed a prototype for the Moroccan Ministry of Health that was developed in 2010. And on the lower um, left, you see a proposal from Stantec working with stack design for um, containers to clinics, which is C23, a women's health clinic. Three of these were um, deployed to Haiti in the aftermath of the uh, 2011 earthquake there. And there are intermodal containerized systems. So the first type I mentioned was a tent-based systems. The second are vehicular nomadic units. And the third are <coughs> intermodal containerized systems, which can be either a custom um, fabricated containers that are shipped as a complete volume, or they're um, modified existing containers. As, as you know, we have a surplus of these ISO containers um, in, many, in many parts of uh, North America at this time, due to trade surpluses, which is one reason. And then the fourth type is a flat pack and a pop or pop-up system for clinics. Flat packs are not too different from what you might find at IKEA. They come in, they come disassembled, designed for disassembly, and then for assembly. And then, but only in this case, they're designed for reassembly again for redeployment. And the fifth type are are hybrid systems that are a combination of any of the previous four. They could be uh, use of a tent or a vehicular nomadic unit. These vehicular nomadic units go back to like the early TB and polio clinics that were used in the 1950s. Um, and then more recently for women's health or for primary care immunizations or clinics that go out to rural areas to deal with migrant populations that 
particularly in the U.S., that don't that aren't insured, and that they fear going to a health center for fear of deportation. And um, there's a, an example here of the Blue Med response system, which is used also in Haiti in 2010. And this is this example on the left is a hybrid system, which is a combination of a custom container uh, system with a tent structure. And this was designed by uh, one of my students at, and um, for deployment in, um, in this case, in Washington, D.C., a few blocks from the White House, in the aftermath, hypothetically, of a bioterrorist attack. So, but I want to focus more specifically on um, these pop-ups tonight. I want to riff on this briefly for a few minutes. And what we did was <clears throat> I brought a team of architecture graduate students down to Charleston, South Carolina, and the same team went to New Orleans. And it, what, what we did was really not that different, maybe in some ways, from what Robert Venturi did in the early 70s when he brought his Yale students to Las Vegas to study the morphology of the Vegas Strip and what became learning from Las Vegas, which probably a lot of you have heard of or if not read. And this is a 21st century version of that. In, in, the, in the context of climate change and of its broad ramifications for everyday life in these threatened communities. So these two communities were chosen because, uh, Charleston and New Orleans were chosen because they both uh, are at great risk of um, disaster from the uh, ramifications of sea level rise in the case of Charleston and New Orleans and hurricanes that can take a direct hit. The, uh, the, the last direct hit to Charleston was with Hurricane Hugo in the mid-90s, but 11 died, which is terrible. And, but in New Orleans, we all know of the 2005 mega-disaster of Hurricane Katrina, where over 1,800 people died. And so they are, um, it remains a very vulnerable community, New Orleans. Um, they've uh, implemented a $14 billion upgrade of the hurricane levy system around the New Orleans metropolitan area funded by the U.S. federal government, but it still has problems. And um, it, even the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers doesn't say it's a foolproof system. So they've changed their tune. Before Hurricane Katrina, they, would, they, they in, um, told the public that they would be safe, which was really never really true. In the case of Charleston, they don't even have, they have very minimal defenses right now. And they're talking about building a seawall raising the seawall that they have that was built, the one they have now is over 100 years old, built along the battery on the southern tip of the peninsula, if you're familiar with the geography of Charleston. And they now are beginning to experience what Miami's experiencing with sunny day floods. With, it doesn't have to be a torrential downpour, but they have flooding in uh, many neighborhoods that never took, wa took on water before. And so it's similar to what you hear about in Miami. Miami's experiencing these sunny day floods now with high tides as a function of sea level rise. And so around the Medical University of South Carolina, this is happening quite a bit because they happen to build a medical center in the, a floodplain. And so on days where it's sunny and clear, they have water that they're walking through from the parking lot to the hospital. So what we did was we, I, we went to the, the thesis of this is essentially, and in terms of how this expresses this super architecture construct that Dr. Peters has articulated in the introduction to this special issue, as it expresses super architecture, it's a heroic, in some ways, in its intent, socially, to, to, but yet quite diminutive and almost invisible in its physical presence, because what we did was we went down to look at host structures. We did our due diligence by identifying 19 host structures in these two cities that could host a pop-up clinic installation in the aftermath of a disaster. So that they can, these, um, these are flat pack systems that can be transported to a site and then set up in a building, that a pre-existing building. And these buildings can be of any type from heritage structures such as this Church of Christ, which is on um, Rutledge Avenue in uh, an African American neighborhood in Charleston, to uh, a, a car dealership showroom, to a, um, a high school gymnasium, to a bank, to um, a number of uh, shopping malls. So I'll show you a few examples briefly. But this is a church, and it shows an installation that the student teams developed in response to 
the need to bring people in back to their communities as quickly as possible because what happens in a disaster with the forced emergency evacuation is that everybody has to leave. And there's, when, but when it's possible to come back again for repop, for the, to begin the pop process of repopulation, there are very few amenities available. And so, and in the case of both uh, what would happen in Charleston, their, their major hospitals would go offline pretty much completely. And they would have to rely on external um, air medvac to bring uh, victims out to nearby um, medical centers in different cities such as Atlanta or Char uh, Charlotte. And in the case of Katrina, all but one hospital went offline. And there were many deaths in, in some of the hospitals. And in the case of one nursing home, 40 residents drowned in their beds in Katrina because the owners of the nursing home were recalcitrant and they, they didn't think they needed to, they canceled the contract with the evacuation buses, the school buses that were going to bring the residents someplace else. But, and then there's the issue of forced re evacuation. But when people, to bring people back, the, the assumption here is that you can bring people back to their neighborhood more quickly if you can bring a facility in very quickly. And if it's in an existing structure, all the better. So this is one example of a church, and this is what an installation, an installation might look like. It's modular, and it's, it's the architect working with an industrial designer, perhaps to develop a new synthesis of their skills in an interdisciplinary way. So it requires us thinking beyond just as architects and beyond our own education, because the, pro the industrial designer can offer so much and in terms of the way this is expressed in the interior spaces, how these can be set up. Here's an example. In the Lakeview area of New Orleans, this is a bank that water went up all the way up to the, the beginning of the second floor, just the underside of the second floor in this bank. Because this, was, this area it took on at least three meters of water, this neighborhood. And there a lot of people, well, many people drowned in this neighborhood. So we looked at a lot of the, demo, we did a demographic analysis of um, the people in the area, and we, we, do, we studied a lot of building. We did context analysis in, look, in terms of looking at um, the neighborhood context. And so here, this is an installation shown on the second level on this bank, in this bank of a clinic, which would be a primary care clinic, or it could be for, used for emergency triage. And it could be set up for any length of time. Here's an example of a high school. It's acting up. Don't act up. Um, and um, it's a high school in Charleston that shows how the large gymnasium could be repurposed as a clinic, as a temporary pop-up clinic. And uh, here is the Riverwalk um, shopping mall along the Mississippi River in New Orleans, uh, showing how it, a portion of that mall could be repurposed as a, as a uh, pop-up clinic. And this might be one of, what one of the modules might look like as it's set up. And this is a furniture store, uh, old, old furniture store in the central city area of New Orleans. It didn't, this neighborhood did not flood, although 80% of the city did. And it shows how an old heritage structure such as this could be repurposed as a clinic. So I guess um, what I'd like to say, if this doesn't act up, is this? Don't act up. So I want to leave you with a few thoughts. We architects are terrible first responders. I want to say that again. We architects are terrible first responders in the face of disaster. And we have, an op we have an obligation to do better than we're doing. And this starts in the architecture schools because most of the architecture schools are doing a miserable job of preparing, preparing students for what we are going to all face in the coming years in terms of the challenges. And so what we need to do is um, we need to work in an interdisciplinary way, as I mentioned a minute ago, working with other disciplines who can help us and we can help them in turn and we need to identify host structures, perhaps, in these places that are disaster prone, that so we can anticipate that maybe we might have an arrangement worked out 
with an, on a, on a, maybe a vacant structure, like this building was vacant, then now it has a new very important function that can help to bring people back to the neighborhood so that they feel that they have the confidence to come home again to start to rebuild their lives because so many people are just aching to get back as fast as they can to see what happened to their home or their business or their place of worship and to bring, try to bring some normalcy back to their life. So working with zoning variances, having um, cooperative agreements worked out with building owners and with institutions such as schools and with medical institutions like medical centers to be able to set these up maybe within an existing hospital or, uh, like an, or in a parking deck of a hospital. All of these are all possibilities that I think we need to explore um, because the, needs, the need will be great in the coming years. So to conclude, at the end of this uh, article, sustainable, on the, this notion of sustainable health care architecture and portability, is the underwhelming current reputation of the architect as a first responder wholly justified? Probably so. But before this can change for the better, a genuine attitude of public service, outreach, empathy, and compassion for the plight of persons and places in, in need must exist. We must open up our thinking to be receptive to, these, to the individuals who are impacted by disaster. Off-site built prefab precursors in housing and other building types warrant further research and exploration so that we can learn lessons from them as to their strengths, their shortcomings, and risk factors that can be identified a priori. As for the sponsored client, including NGOs, ministries of health, and policy specialists, it behooves all to embrace far more than occurs now, the vast collaborative potential of architecture, engineering, and industrial design, just to mention a few fields, to work together to improve how things can be done better than they are at present. So transportable architecture for health can contribute to a community's bounce back resiliency, its future sustainability, and therefore its reconstituted collective social capital. Albeit shattered social networks are very challenging to reconstitute in the aftermath of disaster, but the presence of a portable prefabricated clinic, whether it's of any of these five types that I've outlined, can perhaps symbolize that it's safe and okay to come back home again. And this alone can greatly aid in fostering a reaffirmative place reattachment because it's so important to us as a species to have that sense of home and connectedness to place. So we need to experiment, we need to partner, we need to broaden beyond our everyday little compartmentalized views of what we do in our practices and maybe think about what might be possible in terms of partnering with local universities and with other organizations to think about this in new ways to meet the, the global need for a more effective first response sustainable architecture of this type. Thank you. The last speaker that we have for you today um, is Amy Shaw. Uh, Amy is the research director at Mass Design Group. Uh, she directs Mass Design Group's uh, research work focusing on health infrastructure planning, design, and evaluation. She coordinated the production of the National Health Infrastructure Standards for the Liberian Ministry of Health and has been involved in the design <coughs> and evaluation of healthcare facilities in Haiti, Afri in Haiti and the United States. In addition to guiding community engagement and direct assessment, sorry, and impact assessment for Mass's built projects, she's also handled a range of uh, research in initiatives funded by the uh, Robert, Wood Robert Wood Janssen Foundation and the Academy of Architecture for Health Foundation. Um, the <coughs> Her work is aimed at understanding the impact of the built environment on individual and community health and creating tools to inform and guide designers, administrators, and policymakers. Thanks very much, Amy, for speaking today. Okay. So um, a little over a year ago, I went into the hospital for a routine seven-month ultrasound, and I didn't end up leaving for some time. Um, until that point, um, other than the enormous surprise of being pregnant with twins, um, things had gone very smoothly. Um, but over the next two months, I went through 
a huge spectrum of spaces. Um, there were seven different types of trash cans in my, in my patient room. I couldn't figure out what they were for. Um, I didn't see many people or a single plant in that time. Um, and despite the amazing medicine um, and with two newborn babies, it certainly didn't say, you know, this is a place of life. Um, so it made me really reflect very deeply on the work that we were doing at home as well as abroad. And as a nonprofit architecture for a masses mission is really to research, build, and advocate for um, built environments that improve lives. So um, today I'd like to talk a little bit about how some of our work um, honing in on one specific moment of the human experience, childbirth, uh, just as a kind of slice, has evolved um, over time, how it reflects our thesis of what design has agency to do, um, and also um, you know, how we've incorporated learnings across successive projects, which I think is interesting and important to step back and think about. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Maternity Waiting Village Project in Malawi to research we've done on U.S. Uh, childbirth spaces with Ariadne Labs uh, to several hospitals um, now under construction in Rwanda and Liberia. So I'm not actually going to focus on the kind of locally fabricated aspect of our work, which I think is normally what we talk about, but to almost take that as a, a given, that we know that we need to create um, environmentally sustainable um, approaches and, and focus really on the kind of super aspect that you're bringing up. So what more can architecture do? Um, so uh, just to introduce the first project, in 2013 we were approached by the Malawi Ministry of Health and uh, UNC Malawi, a partner institution, to design a maternity waiting home in the Kasungu district of Malawi. So maternal and infant mortality in Malawi, um, as in many sub-Saharan nations, is a really major public health challenge. And here, the main issue being access to care. So um, expectant mothers have to walk very long distances through mountainous terrain in order to reach health facilities. And as a result, um, only 60% of women in Kasungu district at that time were being attended by a, a skilled professional, a medical professional. So the idea behind maternity waiting homes is to provide a place for women, particularly those with high-risk pregnancies, to um, stay in the weeks prior to delivery so that they can await labor in safe proximity to a health facility. Um, they're increasingly a, a very popular intervention in developing contexts, but also um, you know, rural contexts, like we see them in Alaska too. Um, but uh, research showed that they really range in effectiveness um, due to the lack of space, um, uh, kind of basic comforts, ventilation, and, and sanitation. Um, in Malawi, uh, the existing government standard was um, this barracks-like building with uh, 36 women crowded into one um, dark shared room, and the space wasn't only uncomfortable, um, it was also undignified. Um, you know, how many of you, uh, even if you're a man, put yourself in a woman's shoes, um, would want to come to a place like this to give birth, or prior to giving birth, even if it meant that um, you would have an attendant and more safe birth. So our challenge was, how could we um, increase utilization by rethinking the design and create a more positive experience for women coming from remote villages? So from our immersion and our facility visits and our time spent on the ground with um, pregnant mothers and families and caregivers, we were really inspired by the social interaction that we saw going on. It was a very different culture of birth to what we have in the US. Um, and we knew that in order to attract women, um, the spaces needed to not only be safe and comfortable, but uh, dignifying and support community and social interaction and also educational programming um, so that waiting could be leveraged as a productive, empowering opportunity. So our um, so-called village design broke up the maternity waiting home into a series of more intimate sleeping rooms arrayed around a, a series of different courtyards um, added uh, toilets and showers, as well as shared common spaces for women to uh, cook and meet and talk, um, as well as um, space for secure storage of, of personal items. Um, we thought it was really important to incorporate um, a variety of bench types of seatings, uh, seating outdoors to enable women to gather and talk in, in the shade and 
also kind of double at nighttime as sleeping spaces for um, their accompanying family members who would come with them. Um, and because we wanted to really test this as a potential model for an improved um, replicable Ministry of Health standard, we designed the building as a compound of modular units that could be expanded around a column grid um, and adapt to different types of site variations. So in, in addition to supporting some of these ideas around social interaction and um, inclusion, the building massing also really needed to respond very specifically to Malawi's climate. Um, so informed by a lot of modeling studies that we did, the, um, the roof angles and the overhangs were optimized for um, shading, natural daylighting, um, natural ventilation, um, and then a series of uh, trim walls also um, were able to help the buildings um, absorb sun during the day and then uh, radiate heat during the colder nights. So, you know, keeping with the kind of low fab ethos, which I think um, is often the image people have when they think about our, our work, um, I guess I'll kind of reiterate here that that's really uh, an idea about the fact that we think that the process of building, um, to your point, Robin, and thinking about materials and um, and the techniques of construction is as important as the final product, not only to um, do less harm, but to do good. And um, in our practice, it's really important um, for us to be able to leverage local labor techniques and materials, um, including, in this case, the um, compressed stabilized earth blocks, uh, masonry columns, and um, locally sourced timber to be able to invest in the local economy, to be able to build stewardship and um, lower the build building's embodied carbon footprint. So after the building opened in 2015, we um, initiated an impact evaluation to understand which built spaces and features were uh, most associated with user satisfaction. That was the kind of mission that drove our, our design in the first place. So we developed a, um, a study. We got it approved by the Ministry of Health IRB review uh, process. and. We surveyed um, 300 women at our facility as well as at a comparable Ministry of Health facility um, about their experiences and we aggregated our data. And we also conducted a series of um, qualitative interviews. So what the um, quantitative data analysis uh, showed was that the village design had um, higher satisfaction ratings for the majority of the design features that um, we examined from sleep spaces, um, to building maintenance, thermal comfort, um, kitchen facilities, outdoor spaces, air and water quality, and, and overall satisfaction. Um, but the, from the interviews, I think what we were really able to understand was that part of the, the reason that the new design was successful was because it wasn't framed as a health facility for at-risk patients, um, but as a community space for expectant mothers to learn and talk and um, support one another um, designed in connection to their lives at home. So, you know, this was one of the images that I had in my head as I was in the hospital, the um, daily ritual of dancing and singing that happens in the courtyards, and the idea that, um, that childbirth spaces could be more than just clean and comfortable and, and safe, but full of joy and color and, and life. Um, um, another very different thing that I had in my head at that time was um, a research project that I recently finished in collaboration with a team of clinicians from Aria Ni Lab. So for, for those of you who don't know, um, it's run by um, a kind of doctor writer named Atul Gawande. He publishes a lot in the New Yorker and has a series of really fantastic books. Um, so after seeing uh, a presentation by Mass in 2014, an obstetrician named Dr. Neil Shah approached us, and um, he and his team had been doing a lot of um, work looking at the differences in uh, the management of hospital labor and delivery units. And after seeing our presentation, they had an aha moment where they realized, wow, like a lot of the management practices that we're studying um, are likely very supported or hindered by the physical design of the, of the units. Um, <laughs> So together with Ariane Labs, we launched a, um, a one-year exploratory study funded by a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And what we really wanted to find out was um, if the design of childbirth facilities 
could affect clinical decision making in childbirth, and specifically the link between um, design of the units and cesarean rates, which vary from 7 to 70 percent, depending on basically what facility you walk into. Um, so we wanted to find out what were the spatial variables that might contribute to that huge variation, a very shocking variation. Um, so this study was um, unique for, for a few reasons. One, you know, it was a clinician-architect collaboration, which I think was um, really productive and great, but the scale of the study was also very unique. So from our literature review, we found that most academic studies in that particular area focused almost exclusively on um, patient satisfaction um, at the scale of the labor and delivery room, looking at um, material finishes, size, orientation, daylighting, and views to nature. Um, but we were interested in the system forces that might compel clinicians to make decisions um, in one way or another for cesarean or vaginal delivery. And so we really wanted to uh, broaden our scope to look at the unit scale. Um, so we recruited 12 uh, very diverse um, childbirth facilities located throughout the U.S. They ranged from a really tiny rural freestanding birth center to a uh, L&D unit at a major urban teaching hospital. Uh, we quantitatively measured <laughs> space use data um, as well as conducted site visits, which allowed us to gather um, some really rich uh, qualitative information about um, the processes and culture of care at each facility. And um, the results of our analysis um, allowed us to generate a bunch of testable hypotheses around um, what we thought design was, do was doing and um, linking certain design uh, metrics or measurements to cesarean delivery. So I'll just breeze over a couple of examples of what I mean pulling from the um, final report from the study. So as one metric under facility capacity, um, we looked at annual deliveries per patient room and we found that there was a really uh, huge variation of room demand. So one birth center, as you see on the left, had one delivery per room every four days, while all the way to the right, um, a large women's hospital saw more than one delivery per room every single day of the year. And there was um, a relationship between uh, room demand and higher C-section rates. And one explanation was that you know, clinicians at busy facilities uh, might feel pressure to perform C-section simply uh, to move patients to the room more quickly and kind of free up the beds. Looking at uh, staff workload, um, one of the metrics that we looked at was walking distances. So when caring for multiple patients, um, the distance between workstations uh, or between rooms can really affect staff workload. And we found that uh, facilities with greater distances between rooms and between workstations were associated with higher C-section rates. Um, then under staff motivation and accountability, uh, we looked at collaborative spaces. Um, the idea being that uh, having spaces where nurses or uh, physicians could work or take a break together um, would allow for or might allow for a greater continuity of care, uh, transfer of patient information, um, and the ability to redistribute work at critical moments to relieve staff pressure. And we found that facilities with more collaborative spaces had um, fewer C-section rates. And then finally, as one metric under the culture of care, which is a little bit of a vaguer, um, a vaguer bucket, uh, we looked at patient accessible spaces. So some facilities are designed more than others to promote a kind of natural labor process by providing spaces for patients to ambulate and walk around in um, rather than being confined to their room or bed uh, while they're in labor. So we measured floor area accessible to patients and we found that facilities with a greater proportion of um, patient accessible space uh, had lower C-section rates, whether it was outside or, or inside. And then you know, beyond, so these were some very like specific uh, kind of factual learnings, but beyond those specific learnings, we, we had some kind of bigger insights that stuck in our heads um, as we uh, walked away and kind of prepared for thinking about what the next study would be. Um, we heard from a lot of facilities that renovation and new construction both um, often take place without an evidence base or without communication between facilities about what's working or not. Um, often they're reactive to what exists rather 
uh, and they're kind of quick fixes rather than um, trying to step back and holistically think about um, what could be and what uh, unique care philosophies and processes are at each uh, unique um, facility. And then we also struck that you know, single ideas or trends. Um, when over-prioritized at the cost of a lot of other needs, sometimes um, kind of hinder rather than support caregiving. So one example was you know, at this um, long uh, art facility that you see in the upper right-hand corner. Um, that was a, a new build where this idea of daylight um, drove the entire design and they wanted the facility to be totally daylight and I think that was a, a great starting ambition um, but the prioritization of that above all else um, caused this kind of long curving floor plate which drove some unintended consequences. Uh, one being uh, really significant workflow issues between um, staff having to run back and forth uh, and waste a lot of time um, in, in transit between patient rooms and between staff spaces. And we had all kinds of interesting uh, feedback from staff and vignettes like one doctor um, having to put gel insoles in their shoes and um, losing, I think, 20 pounds from all of the running around that he had to do, which debatably was a good or bad thing. But um, that was just uh, quite surprising to me. So um, I'd like to spend the last few minutes sharing how um, some of our learnings from the first project that you saw, the Maternity Waiting Village, um, as well as this uh, very different in nature, Ariadne research, how they both have begun to percolate into um, later projects that, that are currently underway. So one is uh, near Genge District Hospital in Kigali, Rwanda, and um, another is the Redemption Hospital in Liberia. They're both under construction, and they're both uh, designed by my colleague John, who's in the audience here too. Um, but in order to kind of breeze over these, I, I have to quickly backtrack a little bit to mention a little bit of the, the history behind their design. So back in um, 2014, the Rwandan Ministry of Health uh, needed a national standard for district level referral hospitals. So we created a series of um, typical site list plans of various hospital departments and wards as a reference tool that could be used to design hospitals on actual sites. Um, and here's an image of a, a kind of example plan. And we had developed these typical plans um, largely based on lessons from our first built hospital, um, Bataro District Hospital in Rwanda, as well as uh, the set of national infrastructure standards that we had uh, developed for the government of Liberia. So um, the Rwandan standards then were applied to the Muni District Hospital as a first test drive, but just now zooming into um, kind of childbirth spaces, um, in Munini the, the pressures um, for the facility were really um, emphasizing private rooms to generate hospital income. Um, so that's all the kind of backdrop of the you know, foundation for near Genge and, and Redemption. But in the case of Redemption, um, open wards were required. Um, and this wasn't something that we pushed back against. It's, it's different than in the US, and here we have a lot of evidence based to suggest that individual patient rooms are necessary and important um, and, and yield better outcomes. But in certain contexts, like um, in, in doing research for our earlier project, Butaro, um, we came across research that showed, you know, in cases where there aren't enough facility staff to safely oversee patients in individual rooms, that open wards are actually safer. So um, we did, however, uh, take it upon ourselves to try and think about how to create an improved ward design. Um, so from, from the Ariadne research project, we understood that different um, phases in the maternity sequence were very unique and demanded different environments. And um, from the maternity waiting village, we understood the importance of uh, enabling a, a culture or a community of care around childbirth. So in near Genge, um, in, the, in the antepartum um, or antenatal space, we maintained a, a, a standard ward layout um, to facilitate a sense of community and to quite frankly allow um, monitoring, which is really important in that um, phase of labor. In the, that kind of active labor space, we 
um, incorporated bench seating around the, the perimeter and um, you can't quite see it in this photo, but um, incorporated uh, a lot of views to the beautiful scenery outside to allow for more freedom of mobility in response to some of the stuff that we had found in the Ariadne research, um, looking at the problem of being over confined or over releg uh, relegated to beds um, in labor. And then in the postpartum unit, which I think is the kind of neatest, uh, that we, we changed the, the open ward layout to try and foster a sense of intimacy for mothers and new babies. Um, so we arranged clusters of four beds and a kind of pinwheel around these half walls to give women more privacy and a cozier feel um, and also allow them to accommodate visitors instead of having to be um, lined up in a hospital ward. Um, and we had tested a, a variety of configurations, including sawtooth, et cetera, but the pinwheel ended up being the most um, efficient giving the given the floor area that we had to work with and also achieve the, the greatest sense of privacy at the same time. Um, and just to wrap up quickly, you know, at, at Redemption Hospital, we had uh, a lot more landscape opportunities. Um, we were able to integrate private maternity gardens uh, with natural walking paths for patients as well as staff. And um, I think it's also worth noting that um, we're all talking about um, design interventions kind of doing double duty and um, in this case in addition to promoting healthy labor um, and, and walking and labor we also wanted to leverage the landscape to reduce mosquito-borne diseases by uh, restoring the wetland environment to increase water circulation um, and create healthy plant habitats in order to um, encourage uh, or promote mosquito eating uh, bird and, and fish species. Um, so, you know, stepping back a little bit and then trying to tie all these together, um, you know, as a, as a firm, Mass designs buildings, we, we carry out research projects, but, you know, I think the, the bigger question that we're after and, and all the presenters today or after um, is how we can leverage design to improve lives. And, you know, just following this very specific thread of projects related to birth, I think, you know, we can understand that as meaning everything from um, creating auxiliary healthcare spaces that are dignified and nice enough to encourage women to seek care in the first place, um, and by extension, in improving maternal and infant um, health outcomes and, and leveraging the experience as a uh, opportunity to build a community among mothers. And, to, as we saw in the case of Ariadne, understanding how physical layout of hospital or, or childbirth units can affect clinician decision making and, and kind of behaviors and, and values and practices around healthcare. Um, to in the last couple of examples, um, laying the foundations for um, systemic uh, thinking and change around improved maternal care at a government level. So, you know, as we all go back to our um, practices and our our studios, I'd like to remind or urge all of us to continue to um, broaden the, the aspirations um, and the definition for what we think design can do and um, what agency and accountability that we all believe we have as architects because I think ultimately, um, you know, we all are doing this because we feel that buildings can be an instrument of health and um, life.